We've got another exciting talk coming up just now. I'm delighted to say that Lucas Zinger, co-founder of Zinger Vehicles, is here with me. We're going to chat about the new 3D hypercar that Zinger brought to show us. So Lucas, um, <clears throat> thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this car. This is the first time it's been seen outside the US, so you've, you've had a couple of opportunities to show it to people, um, and you'll tell us about the reactions to that in a minute. But it's great that it's here, um, coming to Savile Road first. It's going to go to Goodwood, yes, I believe. Um, and so a lot of people will look forward to seeing it in motion. It's great to see it standing still. I'm sure it's even more impressive when it's in motion. But I'm very keen to get something of the genesis of this this car, this vehicle, this hypercar, because reading about it, this is something that has rewritten the how to make motor cars handbook completely. Um, you know, as you've said, and I watched some stuff on your uh, on your website, gone is the production line as far as you're concerned. Um, and I'd love you to explain something about where the technology came from through Divergent, which is the parent company uh, of Zynga uh, Vehicles, uh, and obviously your family involvement in that with your father, Kevin. So how did it come about? I know there's huge investment going into this, but how did it come about? Yeah, so we, we started our development about six and a half years ago. And what's very important to understand is uh, we started as a technology company, not as a car company. And we really built three integrated pillars for digital production. So we started and we built a design software suite, which is generative design driven, where you just give the overall requirements for the component. The load cases you want to support, the mass targets, the attachment points, you run our software and you actually get the real optimized component. So gone are the days of you know, CAD engineers, surfacing engineers, hand designing these structural chassis parts. Instead, our software suite is going to design a part that's much more efficient. Then once we have that perfectly efficient mass optimized design, how do we materialize it? How do we actually manufacture it? And that's where we took additive manufacturing, which was very much so in R&D form, and really started to industrialize it as an automotive technology. And we invented and created our own actual 3D printing hardware and our own materials. So the aluminum that you see on the 21C, that's patented by us, created by us, created by parent company Divergent. And then the last pillar is assembly. So once we've printed the parts, how are we assembling them into a final structure? We've gone away from welding, and we've gone away from assembly line to a cell-based manufacturing method where the robot picks up the part directly and bonds it to another part, like a mid-air Lego assembly where it's always metal to insulating, adhesive to metal. And when you combine those three systems, you have something very powerful, which is digital manufacturing. You have a hardware base, a set of 3D printers, a set of assembly cells, and a design software and the hardware does not change when the design changes. So the 21C, for example, it's gone through many iterations, suspension setups, different frames, optimized performance. Never once have we had to retool for our chassis. And that's allowed us to compress development time and costs way, way down and create ideal you know, layout and architecture and components using this digital production method. And Divergent is a company that's pioneering. And Divergent is working with honestly many other car manufacturers other than Zinger on this row, uh, but Zinger is really the first car and the first brand that is taking this system to the max. It's the first car that really represents automotive going from what you know we will call the traditional way of making things to the digital way. It's fascinating, as you say, I have heard that you are, or the divergent to working with other car companies to provide certain components, but, but obviously this has gone much further than that in that the Zinger uh, 21C is is the, the the greatest use of all of that technology. But coming back to a point you made about you cut you've cut out various stages that a traditional car maker would go through. But in terms of moving from a 3D image on a screen mm -hmm. to a 3D car, in the old days you made a clay model or something like that, or you made a concept vehicle that was uh, machined to a certain size. So the first time you see the real thing in one to one scale mm -hmm. is when you built it. So or for us, did you mock something up that looked like it? For us, there's kind of two distinctions. There's the chassis side, which is underneath the A surface paneling. And that, once we've manufactured it, that's the first time we're seeing it. But we're also not that concerned about the visual looks of our chassis. We're mostly concerned about its function. For the A surface, we design a lot in VR. So we actually all put on our headsets 
and we do our design reviews in virtual reality, which is a lot more engaging and precise than just looking at a computer screen. But before we actually do final sign off on any vehicle, we do usually mill a foam model, not a clay model, but we'll mill a foam typically and do at least a sign off on that. Because I, I understand the value of VR in that, but, but the, there must still be something in, in your core that says I need to see it and touch it, wherever it's made of. Yes. And that's where, yeah, it's probably quicker and easier to mill from, uh, a foam than it is to go and make a clay model yeah. or something. But you've got to see the real thing in, in the real digital life. world is great, but the real world is, is still the real world. And it's nice to know. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to know. But and this is, you know, as we said, you, you having torn up the rule book. So you, you, this is the first time we've seen it here. Uh, production or customer deliveries will start down the line in due course. Um, and there's a limited number of these going to be built. Yes. So we're going to make 80 vehicles total. Uh, we just announced our 13 dealer mobile network. HR Owens is our UK dealer and they've already taken quite some reservations in, so there will be quite a few I'm cars on the London road. I was hearing that anecdotally from one of my friends there. That's good, because I imagine this is, this is, this is a big deal for you in lots of ways, mm -hmm. but you know, in some way, how your product and your company is received is, is gonna be down to the people who represent you. So you've gotta spend a lot of time making sure you've got the right partners around the world. Um, otherwise, the, the, the thing and message is not going to be delivered in the accurate way you want absolutely, it to. Absolutely, absolutely. But equally, you're, I remember you saying, you're, you're keen to, in a controlled manner, welcome people over to Los Angeles um, to come and see where the, where the cradle of the car is. Yeah, we've been very, very intentional about both our dealers and the cars, our customers, our 80 pioneering customers that will actually be driving the 21C. And on the dealers, we picked dealers that have a proven track record, but also that had a real passion for what we were doing, that believed in what we were doing, and to get belief, you have to first get understanding. So when we had the initial conversations, we made sure that our dealer partners really understood our system, understood why the car was differentiated and unique, and now those dealers can pass that on to their customers. And of course, we want those customers to understand the way the car was made, so we welcome them to our LA-based factory to actually see this process. And if they order the car, they can come actually see their car chassis be printed and then see it hand assembled in the general assembly line as well. Which is great, because obviously you, you, this is the start of this brand. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got a lot of work to do over there, because this is not going to be the only model you produce. There's going to be other models that will follow this, I'm sure. You're not going to have that level of investment not fully utilized. So um, you want to start to build a relationship with a, with a growing number of customers um, over the years so that you can continue that customer body to grow as exactly. you increase maybe the variety of what you produce, the number of what you produce. So you're starting from the point that most of the car makers down this road did a century ago. Exactly, exactly. And you know, for us, it's established in the key marketplaces early on the brand. Even if there's relatively few cars, let's say, go to Japan, we still want individuals in Japan, car fanatics in Japan, to know the Zinger brand so that when we have our follow-on vehicle, there's a legacy there already and there's a known image of what the 21C looks like. And at Pebble Beach this year, we'll actually be revealing our next concept car, so our next model, which will be a four-seat vehicle, and will be at slightly higher volume and lower price point than the 21C. Oh, fascinating. That's four in a row, of course. <laughs> that would get a little long. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that'll be great. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be there. The concept lawn at Pebble Beach is definitely a place to see the exciting things that are coming in the future. Well, good for you. So this is, so here you go, in only a few months' time, even though this is just landing in its first version, if you like, you've got something to come up behind it soon afterwards, which is exciting. Um, in terms of um, your ability to have customer input into this, so, you know, the, these are high profile, hopefully um, you know, high net worth individuals that you're seeking to get because it's going to be a high price tag on the car. Um, is there an ability for them to be involved in some of the specification of the car? Certainly, certainly. And what I'd say is on the interior, we've got a program where really you're only limited by your imagination and how you can spec materials, seat geometries, driver position relative to pedals. Yeah. We 3D print the pedals themselves, so we're looking at unique pedal designs for customers. 
We also actually 3D print the muffler and the exhaust system for the vehicle. So we've had several clients come to us and say, can I have unique sound to my vehicle? And that's actually something that we can offer in a one-off program. So to me, this is such a special car, a brand introduction car. I'd like to see every single one of the 80 be quite dramatically different in the features they hold. That said, the body style, the overall image of the car needs to remain consistent. No, I see that, but, but as you say, in, in the same way that you've rewritten other handbooks, normally, you know, even with the most bespoke of, of current production cars, you're limited to what you can actually individually affect. So to do something like pedal position, pedal size, pedal feel, um, and all of that is, is beyond what anybody else is offering, as far as I know. So, yes. so, so yeah, it's not a big interior. There's not a huge amount of different color schemes. You can, I know you can have what you want, within reason, but but the choice but to have the choice on such important dynamic elements of the car is Yeah, is and, and what you see when you see this technology progress more and more, we're gonna get to the point of mass customization where the crash testing that's required today, where some of the homologation aspects of making a new vehicle become virtually validated, where you will have such a correlated crash model and material car and you'll have so many iterations of it or repetitions of it where you're comfortable actually not physically crashing that car. That time will come, that time is not now, but when that time comes, this digital manufacturing method will be the way where you will have mass customization. Which, okay, that's interesting because that takes a lot of time and money out of the development process. Exactly. Um, I mean, you, as you know, you've already got to the stage now where you can, if a model is, is um, not that different, to something that's been crashed and homologated, then you can get away with it being accepted under the same crash rules. Mm -hmm. But normally, you know, a big expense, especially for somebody who's producing, you know, a handful of motor cars, is and they want worldwide sales of it. You've got to go through lots of crash tests to get that exactly. homologated. But exactly. so you can shortcut that, it saves a lot of time, a lot of money. Yes, time to market, and then just flexibility on creativity really being a design-led company instead of a capital-led company. And frankly, all of us in auto today are, are somewhat capital-led on what we can produce and when we can produce it. Yeah, but I imagine as well, for those who are the authorities who are authorizing or homologating or whatever, it, they, they can have a look at the manufacturing process and see for themselves the integrity that's gone into it. So it kind of makes their job easy. Exactly. I'd say in our methodology, having run our own software system, create our own materials and material cards, and then done all our testing in-house. So once we print a full rear frame, it goes on our hydraulic bed, it gets censored up. We've correlated our software within 2% of the real world. So if you ask me, am I confident that world will pass crash? I'll tell you 100% yes. Yeah, you know but yeah. regulation is not caught up with our advancements in software and material card creation and the way that we analyze crash simulation. And you, you, what you've done is sufficiently um, groundbreaking that I, I, can you see others following very quickly? I can't see others are going to want to follow, but they've got a lot of catching up to do, haven't they? Yeah, I think for auto, really, we're going to see them become customers of Divergent, our parent company. I think others will try and break off a piece of what we're doing and compete with us on it. Others will try and make a superior printable aluminum or other alloy. Others will try and make a faster industrial 3D printer. So we will see point solution competitors, but I haven't seen anyone and I don't expect anyone to go after this full system of design, manufacture and assemble, and then actually penetrate one of the hardest industries, automotive, aerospace and defense. But, but also your whatever, four years down the line, three years down the line on this, so you, you, you're that time ahead of them anyway, and I don't imagine you're standing still, so you'll be looking to evolve your processes to make them slicker, cheaper, better, whatever, so you're not, you're not waiting for the competitors to catch up, you're pushing ahead. Absolutely, and, and I'd say our developments are only getting quicker, as in we're developing more IP and more patents today than we did in the early days, because the system's running, there's more engineers at work under one roof now, so our patent and IP mode just keeps getting larger and larger and wider and wider. So we're years ahead, and we've got over 520 patents across the system now, and we've been able to get what I call gating patents, or white space patents. So for fixture list assembly, we've been able to patent that as a general concept overall, so no one should really be able to enter that 
sort of area of our system, uh, period. And you know, we've done quite well on the IP protection That's side. That, sure. In terms of you've got a facility in Los Angeles where you, where you do this, there's nothing to stop you, if depending on how things develop over the next months, years, to say, well, let's build a, a mirror facility in that country or that country or the other side of the US or whatever. So you, you, could, you could grow, not just grow your volume where you are, you could go and build replica sites elsewhere, I guess. That's the plan. So we actually, I can say to this whole crowd, we actually have plans to build a factory in the UK in 2024. Oh, there you go. You heard it here first. Well, that's fantastic. Um, probably not on Savile Row. Might be not outside quite, of town. Yeah. But, but, but this is, as you know, the home of Bespoke. But Lucas, it's been fascinating talking to you again. Thank you very much for coming. And again, on behalf of all of us here, thank you for coming to Savile Row with this. I'm sure a lot of people will be looking forward to seeing it in motion down at Goodwood. So go to the Festival of Speed and see the Zinger uh, 21C in motion. Um, I think we talked about it. You're, gonna, you're not going to drive it. You're going to get somebody who knows the way up the hill to drive it. Exactly. Um, uh, and it'll be quickly, but not too quickly. Um, we want it back in one piece and we look forward to seeing what the future is going to bring, but it's very exciting. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you.